<laughs> um, gracias por acompañarnos, uh, Polina, Michael, Frank. Thank you for being here. Uh, we are very glad uh, to have your presentation of the book and t uh, to hear your talk about the exhibition you have in Moncloa. So I leave you. Hola, buenas tardes. Vamos a hacer la charla en inglés porque están aquí, bueno, más que nada Frank sí habla español, Michael todavía está trabajando este <laughs> en, en su idioma, entonces I'm switching to English right now. Thank you so much everybody for joining. Um, I'm super happy to be here together with Michael Seilstorfer, who is the artist and uh, whom we're basically dedica dedicating this talk to. Uh, we're presenting his newest book, which is literally just out of press and uh, arrived just on time from uh, Berlin, and which was a perfect coincidence because Michael is also right now presenting a beautiful solo show at Projektos Monclova Gallery. So perfect excuse uh, to talk about Michael's work in general, the book obviously, and also the exhibition, which is actually a project that is also published in the book. So it kind of all comes together. And then um, super happy that Frank is here as well, because uh, Frank, who knows uh, Michael's work very well, he, they actually met um, during Michael's last show at the gallery a bunch of years ago, and Frank contributed with a beautiful text in the book as well, which is mainly focusing on um, the ecological or nature-based aspects in uh, Michael's works. Uh, just a brief introduction, I mean, uh, normally Michael would not need an introduction in uh, neither in Germany or Europe in the US, but maybe here in Mexico. He's an artist who lives and works in Berlin, um, who has been um, dealing with a notion of sculpture that is very expanded and kind of constantly revisiting the possibilities of what sculpture or, or actually any media can be. He's been showing internationally and uh, in fact the book reviews 22 years of work already, although Michael um, is 44 years old, uh, there is already a massive history of uh, uh, incredible practice. Uh, doing a lot of work in public space as well, showing in institutions uh, worldwide. And uh, yeah, so we are very um, honored to actually have, especially the project that we're showing right now at the gallery that Michael and Frank will be talking about. And uh, Frank, um, who is an incredible author and just recently published his first novel, The Territory, but also is contributing to Der Spiegel, which is an important um, political magazine in Germany since 2016, I think, uh, constantly writing beautiful texts and mainly talking and investigating around art, um, political eco uh, ecology, and, uh, well, many other topics as well, obviously. But, um, yeah, well, thank you so much for being here. And um, we're already with our champagne. And uh, I'm giving... Frank is perfectly prepared for... for <laughs> <laughs> for, for the talk and <laughs> and we have also a little presentation uh, there on the monitor so that you have a little bit of uh, visual impulses starting with an installation that um, actually has to do something with what we're showing at the gallery right now so we're just starting over there I will be in charge of this and um, Frank Muchísimas gracias por recibirme Bienvenidos a todos and thank you for the introduction. Yes, I met Michael at the gallery Projectos Monclova in 2017. And Michael is um, one of the most influential sculptures now in our generation in Germany. But, uh, well, he's time, landscape and space is a matter, a material in his works. At the same time, which is very un special for a German, uh, he has in his art um, a sense of humor. And um, especially in Germany, you have to be very serious to, take, to, to, to be taken seriously with the art. And so, Michael, for you, it's also your art also allows to laugh and smile when it comes to your art. Am I right? Oh, now it's serious. <laughs> <laughs> now, now, now I have fear. <laughs> no, I think um, 
I think humor is, is sometimes important and I think it's a, an important layer in my practice and I think it makes people look at the pieces and step in and be interested in it and I'm always interested that pieces have like different layers and humor can be like an entrance door like to uh, have a look at the piece and step in and look further what's happening there. And <coughs> we look here at the first piece you did 22 years ago. <coughs> its name is Forest Cleaning or Cleaning of the Forest. And you draw uh, a square and obviously you cleaned a space here uh, with a um, Se, se, se be, se, um, a wood brush or something like that well, se, se, well, uh, and um, and you changed the space what have you created here I think it's really the very first piece I've done it's the first piece I've done at the art school in 2000 so when I was like 20 years old <laughs> and um, I think I, I wanted to start with something new and not with like adding materials. I thought it's good to start a piece by taking material away and clean something and prepare like a ground or a space for whatever might come afterwards. So it's a very first piece it's, and it's a lot of things in the piece which are still important in my practice, like working with existing materials, working with the contrast of nature and geometric, man-made space, white cube space. So I went into the forest and what I did was like just cleaned a kind of cube within the forest um, by taking material away. And uh, of course it was in public space, people who came, that came by didn't know what happened there, whether it was like a chemical accident or someone prepared to build like a house or whatever. Yeah, it's super interesting. Here, it's the first example for me that <coughs> Michael uses nature as a material, as an expressive construct, um, because actually there is no empty space. Um, the, the mushrooms are still there, the, the, the roots are still there, so the imagination that, that something is artificial or nature is constructed by just a rectangle here, which refers to Western notion of nature. And <coughs> maybe the second one, we see, ah, this is a video work, also very early, 2002. But I hope it's working. Can we get it, like, running the video? Ah, yeah. This means three cubic meters with a view. It's a house. Yeah, it's also made the, all the very first pieces I did in the Bavarian countryside. So, of course, as a student, I didn't have the possibility to work in galleries or institutions. So I did a lot of those pieces where I came from, like in the countryside, in the forest. And all the, this piece, like, happened there. I just bought a cabin from a farmer and fired it in its own chimney. And the title is Drei Sterne mit Ausblick, which means... Mit which means like three cubic meters of wood with a good view. Because the more you burn, the better the view is on the landscape. <laughs> so that's, the, um, but I mean, it's very beautiful in my view because seeing it now, uh, a house that is dismantling piece by piece that burns itself, it could also be a perfect allegory now when it comes to climate change, the house we burn, nations, people, many people burn our own livelihoods. And also the, um, the part of the transformation between house and home, it's not a real home anymore. And, um, but tell me, how is your art also connected to your bio biography or the birthplace still? I think like every piece is very much um connected to my own history and to my life. I think when I made this book now um, and, and I reviewed like what happened um, in the last 20 years, I can read it more or less as a diary, I think. So I, I, I'd really like, I would say each piece I know in what situation in life I was and why I did it. And, of and, and you were happy or sad by, oh, <laughs> by, by that piece, for example. This is time 
is no motorway and uh, also showing one of your main concepts, no? Ta temporality and transformation. Yeah, I think it's a lot about time. It's about a lot of resources, about um, things getting used up, about a timeline. That's a piece I did um, in 2005. So that's also like a change in my practice because during that period I was, it's, I was invited slowly to show in galleries and institutions. So the piece had to do something else. So I had to do work for exhibition spaces. And I, I did this piece during our uh, residency in Los Angeles. Right. So it has to do, of course, with urban life, with traffic. And you see a car tire pressed against the wall powered by an engine, like doing burnouts constantly. And the piece is called Time is Not a Motorway. And of course, it's pretty aggressive. It smells like rubber in the space. The floor fills with rubber dust. And you literally can feel like time like passing by when you have a look. This is something also what is uh, important for you, that you feel, smell, and um, that it's not the sculpture doesn't stay in a fixed state, no? That's uh, like, I think this piece reminds me a bit like Gordon Mata Clark, or um, they have the imagination of um, expanding piece, not in a fixed state. Yeah, I think the piece also has to be economic and it has a life on its own. So I was interested how actually a physically small piece can fill the whole space. Ah. And that's when like smell becomes part of the piece. I think there is, a, there is a nice quote by Andy Warhol who says, I'm actually a very shy person. I would love to be more extroverted but, and occupy more space. But the way I do it, I wear a lot of perfume. And I ah. think that's how this piece works as well. So it occupies the space and becomes like a character by like, spreading out through burnt rubber and, and its smell. All right. And it, it still has this me mechanistic uh, thing that is... Here we go with the um, exhibition view in Proyectos Monclova in 2017, I guess. And these are the famous masks. Uh, they are... Um, some of you know them. <laughs> uh, the famous mask that um, also sometimes use very... Um, rare material, uh, materials like a car fuel tank or for example this uh, this is a mask that breathes or yeah I think there are different masks and I think masks always were a topic also um, within my whole practice in this show in 2017 we showed several mask sculptures but um, the starting point is always soft material so it's cardboard the masks are made very quickly and then they are casted in solid material. Like here you see masks made from aluminium, bronze and iron, but they feel like soft and heavy in the same time. So I was interested also in this gap of like heaviness and softness and when can a mask be um, soft and destroyable and when can it function as a shield and I think that's where they, where they work like in between. And is it important also that they are at the same eye level? Um, I think they are at eye level because, of course, they face the viewer in the space and it became like a, a mirror or like a portrait. And I think you see them as a kind of portrait. And I think another thing that's important, they are like um, in between like very early sculptures, oceanic art, like Maya sculptures, when you, look, when you have a look at the Anthropological Museum in Mexico City and on the other hand they have something like very modern, like almost like machine parts and uh, very contemporary and also this in between was important I think. All right, then this is the beautiful sky of Berlin now. <laughs> at the moment, right? <laughs> I think that's why I was showing it in Mexico City because we wanted to export something <laughs> heavy from Berlin to Mexico City. It's like uh, clouds, it's called Sky Berlin. Uh, clouds made from um, inner car tires, tires huh? like yeah. the rubber which is in the car tires and then they are knotted, inflated with air 
but still they have something very heavy and they were blocking out like the skylight in the gallery and made the introduction to the show. And it's really true. I, I just spoke with friends from Berlin. This is <laughs> right now how Berlin looks. Um, but I like, ah yeah, this is another very, very um, important piece. And I think is it already the video? It's a video. No, I think it's the first slide because it was also shown in this first show at Projectus Monclova 2017. That's why I decided to show the slide. But I think in the next slide we can like experience the video. This, you have to imagine, it's a small town in Germany, a small village uh, in turmoil. Park benches are set up, there's the major looking at it, many, many people. Three cranes are ejected and huge, and it's raining, you see that? Tears. Ah, no, no, not tears. When not yet. <laughs> not yet. <laughs> have we to wait for somebody or someone? No, but I think it's also an important piece to me because ah. it's, it's an introduction to a whole series called Tears, which, which I did for a couple of years. And I think that's like the first piece I did within this series. And what you see is like cast iron teardrops, each about 2,000 kilos, were thrown on the house over a period of two days and slowly like destroying the, um, the building. I mean, it's beautiful. <laughs> it's <very laughs> it's beautiful and it's very bold on the other hand side. And that's uh, but also practice you. You change the met metaphorical quality. I mean, normally you would might um, say tears are something like soft or uh, um, um, something that uh, open doors or open hearts. Here is, they are part of a destruction of a house, a home again. Um, I think tears can also be very solid and like probably as heavy to destroy your surrounding. Um, in but, sense. but I think it's, it's, <laughs> I think it's both in the piece. I think on, on the one hand, it looks almost like an animation, like a computer game. It's, it's, um, you can talk about the humor you mentioned in the beginning, yeah. but I think also this piece has different layers. And also it refers to this very early piece we showed, uh, Drei Stern mit Ausblick, where it's about like destruction of our environment, like um, about our surrounding, whatever. And how did the people in this village react it? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I think it was... <laughs> Um, it was a performance we yeah. did there. It was a very small village, like in Bavaria. It took like two days. And of course, it was very spectacular. Like people brought like their beer cans there, put their tables there and watched the spectacle for kind of two days. But did people approach you then and said, ha I have also a house or uh, so on some object. Can you please destroy it by... <laughs> By doing art, <laughs> um, I s they mostly said, "Oh, there might be easier ways to destroy it." <laughs> what the All fuck right. are you doing there? <laughs> but when it, for you, it's actually the and it's well, it's you, you're seeing in a process. Is the process also sometimes more important for you than a finished object? The object. I think the process is important because I think the when you do it, it's always changing. Like when you physically do it, you can't plan it. So the process is important, but finally it's always about the, the finished piece, so which I have in mind. But you can't have the finished piece without the whole process. Okay. So the next one would also an installation view? Yeah, I think it's the same piece. And I think it's leading to the next show because that's where all of this piece was shown. That's Johann König Gallery in Berlin, show I did in 2017 called uh, Hitzefrei. You have to translate Hitzefrei, that, that <laughs> That's a very German <laughs> word, <laughs> Hitzefrei. Uh, when, you, when you have in school, especially free time, because it's so, so, so hot weather outside. So it's, I don't know, Polina, help me. 
<laughs> no, there is no translation. It's very obviously very German. It is indeed when uh, you would get off school basically because it's simply too hot. Something that we would not necessarily experience in Mexico because it's always rather hot uh, comparatively to Berlin. Uh, so it's definitely a concept, but it's literally like as a school kid, you would be like looking forward to it. You would be like, oh my God, it's summer, it's 30 degrees, hitze frei, right? So it's like, uh, yeah, off school because of heat. Um, yeah. And of course, when you entered the gallery, there was a pile of wood again, which was fired during the exhibition. And um, we see in the next picture. Now we see the main space of the exhibition. And um, I have to say, like, this exhibition space used to be a former church. So a very brutalist looking building, very industrial building. So I wanted to use the building or like focus on the different qualities of the building. And the piece was really site specific. Um, so it looked like a church, like a factory line, and hit the fry on the same time. And I installed um, six car bodies from, the car, from different car factories, taken from the factories, painted in black. And I installed like pipes, exhausts through the ceiling of the gallery. And where the engines of the cars were, I installed um, ovens, which was fired during the exhibition constantly. It's interesting for me, um, if you say now, um, the context with the church, so it looks also very religious or spiritual uh, as gods, uh, the cars that bring freedom or allow freedom. On the other hand side, they don't move, no? They just burn, they just pollute, they expel the gases through the chimneys. Um, yeah, and also they expand in the space, like the spa they change the quality of the space. When you open the exhibition, it was February, it was like minus ah. 15 degrees outside and in the exhibition space it was almost like very claustrophobic because it was like 40 degrees, the, the ovens were constantly fired, the chimneys were smoking like ah. uh, outside the gallery mm -hmm. and um, so the, the piece was expanding within the exhibition space due to the heat. It like I interesting. I didn't know that, but, but yet it makes now more and more sense. And I think that's why I was showing the video piece in the clock tower, because the idea was that the heat like kind of condensates up there and comes ah. down as drops on the building. Ah, here we go. Yeah, you we have more close-ups. You can see some details of the, of the ovens. Also like skeletons in, in a way, no? Yeah, they came straight from the car factories. Yeah. Like all the, those like uh, slides on the bottom are like from the factory lines. This is one of my favorites, I must admit. It came very, very fragile, very small. It's um, a, spl a plant sketch, but um, it's a plant sketch from thistle and nettle. Uh, Cardo y Otiga, yo creo, se llama, in, which remind us of botanical drawings and uh, uh, contemplating nature. On the other hand side, it stinks, the paper stinks, be because it's sandpaper. Yeah, it's, it's like uh, painted on sandpaper, like with a kind of how would you call the pen? It's like kind of a uh, griffel. So it's like uh, a stone almost you paint with. And I think it already creates like a handicap within like painting and it makes it much, or drawing, it makes it much more difficult. And um, I think it's, it's about the beauty of the object, of the sistel. And on the other hand, it's like of the, uh, about the very in industrial and grinding quality of the sandpaper. And this contrast, and when, you, when I draw, I almost have the feeling that the distal, the drawing could be erased at the same moment by the, by the paper you draw on. Yeah, yeah it, it hurts, no? Also, it makes it difficult and it hurts. It like the same qualities, they evoke um, these plants in our human body when you see that. And so this is also interesting how Michael uses the, the qualities of this material to, 
to um, allow also to metaphorically think about um, the, the material in itself. And this is the other plant, yes. <laughs> and then also a piece is now at show at Proyectas Monclova, Forst, which is like a um, bosque comercial or uh, a commercial forest, uh, such a where you take out the trees and uh, cut them out. It's, it's not a living mm. forest, it's a commercial forest. And for me, well, this piece is where, <laughs> me personally, it gets very close because I, um, I have in mind um, a poem from a German writer, um, Christian Morgenstern. He wrote, I have not plucked a flower today to, to give you her life. That means, uh, no te he cortado una, unas flores para uh, darte su vida. In, in, in a sense, to save the process of cutting a flower to give life and also it's very for me it's very sad and poetic in a way that you i mean t tell tell us more about this work how, how it no that's a piece which is shown at uh projectos monclova gallery at the moment and um you see um i think it's again like a kind of gap or contrast you see industrial motors under the ceiling and on each motor you have like an upside down hanging tree which is very slowly rotating and on the one hand it's like as you said like very poetic it's almost like a ballet within the space and you really can feel that the trees are like by time um, getting more dry leaving their own leaves brushing their own leaves becoming older and on the other hand, it, it has also something very brutal, like hanging a tree upside down, cutting it. Um, and, and I think there are also a lot of layers in it. Yeah, one layer, um, I find this beautiful from a Mexican philosopher who have poetry. This work is Maria Antonia Gonzalez Valerio. The living appears here in its fragility, in its materiality and in its death. And... Um, I have also, when it, when it comes to the me mechanics, I've read um, in, in the New York Times an article and there are scientists talking about a new technology who will save lives in our heated time of climate change. Um, it, because it cools the city to 10 degrees and it provides shadows and they called it tree. And it, it was for me so, wow, how mechanical is now Western thinking uh, science uh, in some way um, that, that, that you call this a tree, a technology. At the one side, I find it beautiful that you take this nature, culture, mechanical as a material also. When it, well, I come from ecology and that's why I see in your work, no? But how you allow also to think about um, the, the trees um, and there is a brutality because of this mechanics around them. Yeah, but I think there is. It's already what what you said in the beginning. It's already in the word forest, which you don't have in any other language, and which already v refers to a kind of industrial used yes. forest. It's already there, I would say. Yeah, yeah. That, so forest means really like an industrial forest, and to translate this now in this room, it was um, for me very, very strong emotional uh, part. I mean, how you experienced that? Yes, uh, it's actually one of my favorite pieces. Uh, generally, it's a piece that, in fact, it's not the first time that you're presenting it. It's a piece that you won a prize with in, in, in Berlin, and it's been shown already in several institutions worldwide. And I think it keeps its incredible um, relevance. And I think what's so beautiful in general about Michael's work is obviously always takes on the idea of something ending, which is generally when I think, I mean, and then there are other works as well. But um, obviously what we appreciate most, um, besides the ecological uh, point in this work, but generally 
obviously what we appreciate most in life are things that end eventually. And everything has its cycle and everything has an end. Um, our life, beauty, love, uh, whatever, like the most, it's basically it's the usual um, universal things that probably the, you know, all the poets and authors through life have been writing about and that remain ultimately our force for actually doing things. And what we probably won't value that much is something that we know is going to be there forever, uh, which are not that many things, obviously, but uh, uh, our melancholy, nostalgia, and all these feelings that actually really move and drive us are obviously based on the fact of ending. So, of course, having this piece in the gallery where you walk in, you have, in our case now, three upside down trees and they're moving and it has something incredibly beautiful and meditative about it because they're almost like dancing in the room. They're circling around. You can hear, you can hear the leaves touching the ground. You have the leaves actually um, generating round drawings on the floor. You can smell the trees. You can already see how some of the leaves are falling down. So you literally experience the fact of something ending. I'll, I'll, I'll get you the word. Um, and that's what makes you, obviously, straight away, that makes you feel something. You know, there's like no way that you, do, you, you would walk in there and not feel maybe some sort of nostalgia or, you know. And obviously, it's interesting because it's always kind of present in Michael's work. There's this kind of um, back and forth between nature and technology, you know, or, or nature and culture somehow. This aspect of something going and something sometimes also actually destroying itself, as is the case, for instance, with the car wheel, right, that it's turning around and it's exactly what it's supposed to be doing. It's supposed to be turning. It's supposed to be quick. It's supposed to bring you somewhere. But it's what it's doing in the exhibition space is actually destroying itself because it's running against the wall and it's, you know, and the rubber is falling down and it takes over the full space. And you're like, yeah, of course. Right. So this whole again, then more on the political level, idea of progress or whatever, uh, that we kind of start questioning then and think whether it's really um, where we want to be going, right? So, yeah, that's why this one is one of my um, favorite works. And um, there's, you, 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 can do, you can do the next, but uh, there was also some, someone uh, who would like to say something. Here, here we go. Gracias. Um, first of all, this artwork is beautiful. It suddenly reminded me of a piece by Klaus Liedman that you can Google it. It's a forest that was planted inside a stadium. So it looks really amazing. And I think it's really connected to this Klaus Liedman artwork. Thinking about this shift in how we, how we view nature, I think it's beautiful. I think it's very powerful because ever since the industri industrial age, et cetera, et cetera, I think we stopped regarding nature as it is and just taking it for granted. So. So what, what does it say about making nature the object of our view, you know, the, the thing that we want to see? I think it's really powerful. I think it's necessary just to get thinking about these, these things again and stop taking, it, taking, taking them for granted, you know? And yeah, that's just what I wanted to say. I think it's a really nice piece. And it's necessary on its, on its own way. And that's it. Yeah, thanks so much. I think it's, I think it, um, it's, it's important that, or that's what I wanted to achieve also, that you have like different layers. You don't take nature for granted and you have a look how we treated our days and what we need it for, I think. Thank you. Um, 
Yeah, we were, I mean, I, I don't even know what time it is. We still have like, <laughs> there's so much uh, to talk about. There's also this series that I think we'll maybe just very briefly uh, mention as well. Um, and also it's very important to say that now in this talk we've been focusing ma mainly on Michael's works that are dealing with these topics such as, you know, this kind of... Um, uh, well, uh, that deal either with nature or with this kind of moment of self-destroying uh, somehow or this idea of, of, of an end. Um, in the book, uh, you will be able to explore many, many, many more sites of uh, Michael's works, that some of them more sculptural, some of them more uh, installative. Also, um, there's a series of works that are more, let's say, related to painting, but still also bear a sculptural element. And um, started with a series uh, of tears that is kind of connected to the video that we've been uh, looking at, where these like massive, super heavy tears are falling down and destroying the building. And um, but here we're looking at uh, paintings. These are the tears. <laughs> So These are the that's how it started. That's how it started. They refer, of course, to the um, to the house we saw in the beginning, the heaviness of the tears. Those are called heavy tears, and it, they're painted with lipstick on lead, on the very heavy metal. And like from this series, um, developed a, seri a series called Heavy Eyes. And maybe the, you can go back, like that's a very typical piece of those series, so this, this one. And they, they are painted with eyeshadow on lead. So again, it's about this contrast of the heaviness of the material, the industrial material, and the lightness of the surface, like the cosmetics, the eyeshadow, and the contrast, like. Yeah, I think, uh, especially with the painting, I was, uh, w w there was all some of them in the gallery. So obviously, uh, you're always using materials, found materials, right? Uh, things that already exist and somehow then kind of really working out what's implicit in the, uh, in the material, sorry. There are so many qualities in there. So I feel with these paintings, for instance, um, obviously they're beautiful, minimalist, they refer to different um, art historic, there are all sorts of art historical references as well, you know, Gunther Ferg paintings, etc. But uh, now there's a decision of using eyeshadow, right? And a material that is usually used in the beauty industry. So again, we're kind of coming back to the idea of, of these, again, these kind of big things that kind of matter in life, such as beauty, for instance, or the cosmetic industry, things that, again, also are constantly, it's very interesting because it's also, also something that we're constantly fighting to keep, right? So beauty is something that is obviously temporary and, and um, or especially, uh, well, if we talk about, think about cosmetics, something that goes and there is this constant fight to kind of keep it there. And in these paintings, also b part of the work is, of course, that the the eyeshadow might be, you know, fading and probably leaving the painting at some point. And then it's obviously also applied to a uh, material that is mega heavy. So there's the contrast between light and heavy, but there's also the contrast between what's supposed to be beauty and what's supposed to be mega toxic as well. So there's, of course, also kind of that conceptual backdrop of toxic beauty um, inherent there as well, right? Which is what's so great because it's so minimal, but they're actually so, so like if you start thinking about why using eyeshadow, why using lead, you actually get to some answers and you start thinking about something that which is far beyond the more formal aspect of it, right? And maybe this is a good way to close this, no? It's um, tears on asphalt and uh, sadness dissolves into a fragrance now. And uh, the memory of summer rain on warm asphalt, where have I read? Is that the art of letting go now? <laughs> it's, it's a difficult question, <laughs> but the only thing I can say, that's the last piece in the tear series. It's, it's a perfume I made 
of course you can with the perfume expand in the space and become a sculpture and um, the, the idea is that um, yeah probably it's the end point what you said in the tier series and like sadness becomes beauty in form of a fragrance with that words thank you for having us Gracias. If there's any questions or anybody who wants to ask, it, well, you know, great opportunity to talk to Michael and, uh, yeah, talk about his work. So if we can also do this without microphones. Yes. <laughs> Thanks so much that we can do that. <laughs>